Good morning or good afternoon to everyone, depending on where you're joining us from. Thank you everyone for joining us today for our webinar. Uh, today we'll be discussing Chaos Engineering 101. Uh, my name is Brandon Nyes and I'm a business development specialist at Resolute Software and I'll be your guy behind the scenes for today's webinar. Before I introduce our two speakers, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping topics. Um, first, today's webinar is presented live and is being recorded. Uh, we will be sharing a link with you after the event, so keep an eye out for an email after the event with a link to, to find a review of this webinar. If you, uh, the link that you get will be shareable, so if you have any other colleagues or people who may be interested in this content, go ahead and share it with them freely. Second, our webinar today is scheduled for an hour, including Q&A. And third, regarding Q&A, there is a tab on the right side of your team screen for the Q&A. Go ahead and open that and post your questions in there. One small note about Teams, there is a minor delay on it. So when we see your questions, it may be anywhere between 20 and 30 seconds uh, late. We will try to address them immediately if they apply, but if not, we will be saving them until the end of the presentation. But we will try to make time for everybody's questions today. All right. So today we have two presenters. Uh, we have Billy Ahov from Resolute Software and uh, Kelly Osborne with Gremlin. We will uh, be starting with Kelly, but I'll introduce Billy first. Billy is one of Resolute Software's cloud solutions architects focused on cloud technologies, serverless computing, and continuous integration and delivery. He's a full stack software developer and consultant who appreciates a good challenge. Previously, Billy worked with Forth, Progress, and Study Portals in serverless cloud computing and framework development. Um, and like I said, before we uh, hear from Billy, we're going to be hearing from Kelly with Gremlin. He's the regional sales director for Gremlin and has been in the IT sales and management space for about 25 years. He is armed and ready with a computer science and MIS degrees. And uh, as background, Kelly started out his career as a programmer analyst before moving into the reseller world as a systems engineer. He then moved into sales with very successful stints at HP and Commvault. And since then, Kelly has worked for multiple tech startup companies such as Left Hand, Tegile Systems, Stratascale, and Portworks. And throughout his career, uh, Kelly has uh, developed himself as a presenter for technical audiences around the region, as well as various tech forums, roadshows, user groups, and professional associations. I've had the pleasure of hearing one of one or two of Kelly's presentations, and I know that he's going to deliver a ton of valuable content today. Kelly, welcome to the webinar. Thanks, Brandon. So I'm going to go ahead and turn you loose. Go ahead when you have a chance, and uh, we'll get your presentation up here on screen. All right, there you go. Okay, great. So I appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk about the chaos engineering market. Um, we're going to spend a little time talking about the history of chaos engineering, where it came from, what it is, um, and then ultimately we'll move into a little bit of a presentation on what Gremlin is um, and our part within this market. So um, we appreciate your time this morning and hopefully uh, this will be useful for you and make sure you ask questions if you need to. So um, as an introduction to chaos engineering 101, what we want to talk about is really the origins of chaos engineering, um, why it's come about, and how you can use it in your environments to potentially um, find latent issues. So chaos engineering really started back in the day at Netflix and Amazon. So Netflix started out uh, as a DVD service where they would ship you a DVD in the mail, and then you would send it back and get another one to avoid having to go to, um, you know, blockbuster video or going out of your house to do things. And then about 10, 11 years ago, they, they of course started migrating themselves into uh, being a sharing, uh, a streaming service. And when they went to being a streaming service, they had to move off their on-prem data center into a cloud environment to be able to handle the load. So you can imagine, you know, what it must be like for them to deal with not a thousand people watching a movie at the same time, but hundreds of thousands and now millions of people every single night streaming content from their platform. Um, and of course, this applies to um, 
other platforms as well, but they were the the really the pioneers here. And one of the things they wanted to do when they started pushing everything into uh, Amazon was their platform with EC2. They wanted to make sure that users who were watching content would not see a disruption if there were failures happening in the background. So they built you know elaborate uh, caching layers and things like that, and then they wanted to come up with a way to test failover from one EC2 instance to another. So they developed a small scripting tool called the Chaos Monkey that you could you could actually unleash into uh, an EC2 environment and it would just randomly kill EC2 instances. And they use that to really harden their systems so that their end users receiving content absolutely do not see um, any disruption from their service uh, when, when things go wrong, because things always go wrong. Simultaneously, over at Amazon, they were taking a bit of a different approach in the beginning. Um, they actually had a guy who was known as the master of disaster, and he would go into Amazon data centers um, and unannounced, and then he would walk in and randomly disconnect power cords or Ethernet cables from switches and things like that. And then he would wait and see how long it took their engineers who were monitoring things to discover the problem. And that was really um, trying to enhance their MTTD or their mean time to detection. And then how fast could they resolve that problem or the MTTR? That whole practice that they were going through is what's now resulted in uh, the concept of what we call site reliability engineers, which many companies are now rolling out. That was kind of coined over at Amazon. Um, the other term you might hear in the chaos engineering space is something called a game day. And game days are uh, a day or a set of tests that you will plan ahead of time to run in your environment. So we're going to talk about all this as we go forward, but th those were kind of the origins. Um, and so basically, why is this important? Not just for Netflix, um, everybody now is vulnerable to these kind of headlines. So clearly, if you're a retailer, you don't want to be down on Black Friday or Cyber Monday, that might represent 20, 30% of your revenue. And now it's even more critical because so many companies are online now because of the COVID situation that we're seeing a lot of companies uh, deal with failure in their environment because they're receiving way more load than they've ever uh, had before. And so errors are popping up that no one saw um, previously. Banks deal are dealing with the same thing. Banks are going to online banking as quickly as they can if they're not already there because people don't want to go into the branch offices anymore. And so, um, and previously, of course, uh, airlines going down. But basically, these kind of failures are extremely costly. And when you're thinking about the cost of failures like this, there are many factors. One, what is the cost in terms of lost transactions during that hour, two hour, whatever the outage was? The other problem that is a little harder to quantify is what was the impact on your brand image? Did a customer who was on our site who lost access go to another account, another company, buy a product, and they'll never come back? So lost customers. So that impact on your brand, um, stock price, lost customers, the revenue from being down. And then finally, the thing that most companies haven't done a good job of quantifying is the people cost. If you're managing infrastructure or operations in a company and you're given a pager and then on Sunday morning something breaks at 3 a.m. and you're here on fire trying to figure out what's going wrong. You know, the problem is um, if you're in an environment where you have a lot of these incidents, incidents, you can actually get burnt out. And so we've seen a lot of companies lose really good people who are tired of playing whack-a-mole. Um, and one way to solve that problem is to go to a culture of resiliency and reliability and doing pr uh, proactive testing to find problems before they ever happen. The other thing that's happening out there, and I'm sure everybody is seeing this, is companies are moving away from their monolithic applications into microservices, containers, Kubernetes. Um, they're applying DevOps and continuous uh, development pipelines and moving things into the cloud. The speed of innovation that this brings gives companies a competitive advantage in their markets because now, instead of developing in an annual basis with a legacy approach where you've got a single application and once a year you push out some features and then the rest of the year you maintain it and, and put patches in place, companies are moving to this cloud native type of environment. And 
uh, what what happens as you increase the velocity and adopt these technologies is unfortunately you do increase the operational complexity. So a lot of these new technologies are new to people. They're not as comfortable with them. They're not as uh, many times the software is still in its infancy. Um, and so what this does is it actually creates a problem where you now have something called a reliability gap. And so now what's happening is there are things that are introduced into these environments that you're not aware of. So what happens now is you're now vul more vulnerable to failures. And so this reliability gap is a big, big thing that uh, we're focused on solving and helping customers close that gap. So how do we do that? Um, for one thing, QAT or QA testing is not enough anymore. Um, traditional QA is great for testing your applications, making sure your logic is correct, making sure data is being stored properly, making sure your screens look nice and things aren't misspelled, stuff like that. When you start looking below in these environments and you start thinking about what kind of dependencies, if I break up a monolithic app into containers, which containers are the most dependent um, or in the critical path? How do, I, how do I map that and determine what's important and what's not important and whether my app can survive? Configuration issues. If we move to the cloud and we set up things like auto scaling rules, how do we know that it's actually going to work? So many times companies set these things up without testing them and then on the busiest day, of course, the site doesn't scale like it's supposed to and then they have problems. So um, those kinds of configuration issues, testing in your infrastructure, and then the people and processes, things like your dusty old run books, how do you validate those? These are the areas that a new testing methodology really needs to be implemented to help um, uncover problems ahead of time. And so chaos engineering has been the methodology that's come about. And so going back to once again, Amazon and, and Netflix and what they've created, uh, the term chaos monkey has kind of kept, stayed along with chaos engineering. And really the chaos engineering is kind of a scary term sometimes for executives because they don't understand what we're really trying to do is very, very safe, thoughtful, controlled experiments that are designed to real to uh, reveal weaknesses in your systems, in your people, processes, applications, and infrastructure to avoid the chaos of downtime. And so really, that's the point of doing this. And so um, when we talk about the safety and the methodology, really um, the testing should be done initially in a very small fashion. So you should probably start your tests in a down level environment and come up with a hypothesis. And we recommend starting out testing something that you think will work to validate it um, because maybe you've never tested it. So a good example might be DNS failover. Yes, we have a DNS server and if it fails, we have a secondary or even a tertiary DNS. Many, many, many companies have never actually tested whether DNS failover works. So we give you a test to be able to do that. Um, once you're comfortable with this concept and uh, how to do tests, you can start expanding your blast radius. And when we say expanding your blast radius, that means starting to do more tests, starting to move your tests into production environments, starting to run automated tests. Um, and these are all things that uh, chaos engineering allows you to do. And so once again, it's a very controlled approach. It's not a crazy wild thing that you do where it's very scientific. As you get even more sophisticated in this, um, as many of you see, the old waterfall approach of building applications has now moved into what we commonly refer to as a CICD pipeline. And so you've got a lot of different tool types that are involved in these things. Um, and then it's a circular program. And one of the things that happens in many organizations is they'll put a problem out, they'll solve an issue that's, that's discovered. And then six months later, for some reason, that problem re recurs and that we call that regression into failure. That can happen for a number of reasons. Sometimes something changes. Uh, maybe you restored a backup and suddenly accidentally went back to an old configuration file, or maybe a junior developer accidentally used an old code library and brings something back in that you've already solved. So one of the things you can actually do is start to automate chaos testing as part of your tool chain to make sure that um, you can actually have a kind of an application gate that says, if we don't pass this test, we don't roll this code out. And that way you can constantly make sure that old 
problems that you've solved aren't coming back into your code. Gartner's a big fan of this, and they believe that many organizations will continue to implement chaos engineering practices as part of these initiatives. So, not just individual tests, but there are a lot of different benefits that you can gain by practicing chaos engineering. And yes, individual experiments. Um, I talked about how you can schedule experiments to run automatically, um, how you can run CICD pipeline experiments. The other thing that you can do is create a game day where you have a number of tests that you want to run and you set aside SREs or uh, you know, observability people to watch your monitoring and run a game day to look for problems. And then secondly, the other thing that we had uh, talk about is running fire drills. So just like the original master of disaster training his people to be better at MTTD and MTTR, we can use chaos engineering tools to actually uh, create uh, some, some failure in your environment. And then you can have your observability and operations folks watching from another room and see if they can figure out and how quickly they can figure out what you just did. Um, and so that's uh, kind of a red, red team, blue team type of approach. So there's a lot of different things you can do with these tools to, uh, to find value in your environment, to solve problems, and to train your people to be better. So when we talk about the use cases, it's validating migration to the cloud, training teams, as I mentioned, um, mitigating dependency failure, you know, DR testing. So if you are fully cloud enabled, how do you uh, fun, how, how do you validate that a full region evacuation will occur properly? Verifying your monitoring. So um, chaos engineering tools are not monitoring tools. So you still need to have your data dogs, your app dynamics, your Dynatraces, or you know, new relics in your environment. And many times we hear from folks that have a problem, and the the situation is that they didn't see the problem, and it's partly because they probably didn't configure their monitoring tools correctly, number one. Number two, they may be inundated with so many alerts that the most important ones aren't being seen, so too many the forest and trees problem. So we can actually use chaos tools to validate your monitoring and tune it to make it better in your environment. This dependency failure is also an, incre an incredibly powerful uh, problem that needs to be solved. We've seen sites, uh, for example, a solution architect that I work with um, in, in Florida I used to work for a company called Fanatics. I don't know if you've ever been to Fanatics website, but if you go there, they actually sell, you know, NFL and NBA and MLB and college apparel and co coffee mugs and all kinds of different branded uh, stuff. So if you're a big fan of the school you went to, you can go get stuff there. And so it's just a typical e-commerce site. Um, their biggest days are, of course, are Cyber Mondays and, and, and Fridays. And one of the problems that they found in their environment one day um, people couldn't check out. And the reason they couldn't check out was because PayPal was down. So what they discovered was that there was a PayPal was part of the critical path of their application. And that was wrong because what that meant was if PayPal was down, no one could check out. So now they've changed their product so that, or their, their system so that they check for PayPal ahead of time. And if it's not available, they actually don't even show you PayPal as a choice. And then you can still use your credit card to check out and buy things. So how do you test that in the real world and make sure that doesn't actually happen as a failure? Um, so there are tests that we can use to help you mitigate external dependencies as well. And we'll talk about those. So now that's kind of the primer on the history and practice of chaos engineering. Um, and I think now what I wanted to do was talk to you a little bit about Gremlin, my company, and where we play in this market. So Gremlin was actually founded by people who were experts at Amazon and Netflix and have been involved in chaos engineering from the beginning. And so we are an enterprise chaos engineering platform. Um, and basically uh, we, we set in the cloud and then we install agents on your hosts, whether those are Linux or Windows or daemon sets and Kubernetes, et cetera. And we allow you to conduct chaos engineering experiments um, into your environment. So there are a lot of free tools out there that you can go look for. But what our founders discovered was that, you know, companies like Amazon and Netflix have huge development teams and they were building these tools because they didn't exist before. So now if any company wants to go out and build tools themselves, you're just recreating the work that's already been done. Sometimes you can download some free tools and run them in your, envi in your environment, but there are issues with that. So 
they just dis- decided that there was an opportunity for us to create a platform that had uh, features in it that would allow enterprises to more quickly start finding faults right away without spending years writing their own product and rebuilding uh, what's already out there. So the first and foremost thing is simplicity. Our system is very easy to install, very easy to manage. We have a very simple interface and it's API first. So everything you do on our UI actually calls an API, which means everything you, you do on our UI can be automated through an API call. And it's very easy to capture those API uh, code links. The other thing is safety. Many of the free tools out there like the monkeys and things, they don't have any safety around it. And what I mean by that is that you let it loose and it can't be stopped. Um, we have the ability to immediately halt and roll back any experiment that's in progress to a steady state, number one. Number two, because our agents are communicating to our control plane, which is a SaaS platform in the cloud, if for any reason your hosts, whether they're on-prem or in another cloud, can, cannot communicate to the back plane, um, our host agents will immediately stop the test. We call that a dead man switch. And that means for after two seconds of no communication, we immediately stop. And that way you can be, can, um, assured that there is no way that a test that you're running can go rogue and continue impacting your environment. Security is another important thing. Most of the large companies that we're dealing with, like banks and financial institutions, are extremely concerned with security. And if a CISO heard that someone at one of these organizations had downloaded a free tool from GitHub and tried to run it in a production environment, they would probably be mortified. So we uh, adhere to a lot of different security uh, practices. We're SOC 2 certified, we're ISO 2000, 27001 certified. We have our back. So with our platform, if you have multiple users, we now have roles-based authentication, and that gives us the ability now to have an audit trail of who is using the tool and what tests have they run and what have they impacted. And then, of course, we also have you know, interfaces for SSO, you know, Okta, all the different tools out there that you can use. Finally, the value part of this is the comprehensive set of attacks. So Chaos Monkey is one little attack that does shut down. We have a lot of different attacks. So we have resource attacks. Uh, The four different resource attacks we have are CPU, IO, memory, and disk. Why would a CPU attack be interesting? What if you wanted to validate auto scaling? How do you do auto scaling validation if you're not generating load? we can go in and force your CPUs up to a certain percentage so that you can validate that your um, site will now auto scale up and more instances will occur. You can also use that to validate that when you're done, your rules um, correctly roll back um, those incident uh, um, instances that have been created so that you don't accidentally start paying for resources that you don't need anymore. So validating that with CPU attacks is very, very cool. We can also do things like uh, fill your memory cache up to see how your applications uh, and your site responds to that. Uh, We can constrain disk resources and I.O. In the stateful area, we do have the shutdown attack, which is your classic uh, chaos monkey type of attack. We also have time traveling. Um, A lot of problems that happen in, in people's environments when they're very, very large and they're using clustering technologies and things like that and replication technologies, if you have clock skew where different nodes in your cluster um, have gotten out of sync, uh, how do you test that? We can do that. We can also use the time travel attack to do things like make your site um, think it's at a different point in time in the future to see if you have SSL certifications that might be expiring, to test and see if your site can handle a daylight savings time change or a, a leap year, things like that. On the network side, we can introduce latency so you can see an impact latency in your environment validate things like your timeouts and retries. We can do packet loss to see how resilient your site is to errors and things like that. DNS fell over, as I mentioned, and a very powerful attack that we have called black hole that I'm going to show you in a demo. We can actually black hole internal and external dependencies. So, for example, when I mentioned the site where they were dependent upon uh, PayPal, how do you actually test and make PayPal go away if, if it's really up and running? So we can use a black hole attack to block that IP address so that your site can no longer see that it's there and then you can validate that you still truly have functionality um, you know to be able to deal with that problem so it's a very powerful attack the last thing we've gotten into is starting to get into some more way more sophisticated areas which is 
when you start looking at Fargate and Lambda and Azure functions and other serverless environments, we don't have the ability to install an agent on, on infrastructure that's abstracted away like that. So how do we help you run tests in those environments? Uh, we can actually Im, uh, implement a code library into your applications, into your Java applications and do application fault injection. That allows us to do things like send um, exceptions and latency into an app uh, so that you can begin testing things in those environments where you don't have access to the infrastructure. So basically when you wrap it all together, it's definitely an enterprise platform. We can take all these attacks and we can create schedule those automatically. You can run any of these attacks from an API. You can actually chain uh, different attacks together into scenarios. Um, we have all that safety around the halt button, limiting your blast radius. We have the security that I mentioned with the SSO, um, RBAC, um, you know, all of the SOC compliance that we have. And then the fact that we have a comprehensive set of environments that we work in. We can run in Kubernetes and Docker, and we can run in Windows, and we can run in all the different clouds, whether it's on-prem or not. So you know, it's a very, very comprehensive um, application. So the proof is in the pudding when we start talking about maybe some customers that we have that have actually uh, used our product to to find and solve problems. Uh, Dropbox reduced um, incidents by 10x since they've been using our tool. Um, back, Backcountry, Backcountry is a um, e-commerce site that you know people buy camping equipment and backpacks and hiking gear. And they had a problem that wasn't really quoted downtime. They actually had a problem on the back end on a Black Friday where they had robot pickers in their distribution center um, putting the wrong products in the boxes and shipping it to customers. And it, they didn't actually discover there was a problem for uh, several hours. And by using uh, Gremlin's tools, they reduced their detection time from hours to minutes. And on the last two Black Fridays, they actually had no, uh, absolutely no errors whatsoever. When you're moving into containers and moving into Kubernetes and clustering technologies and clouds, how do you validate? How do you make sure you know pod um, pods will get rescheduled quickly? How do you test all these things? And that's where we've helped Under Armour. Another ac account um, is a streaming service, DPG Media. When they launched their streaming service, they had 200% more traffic on day one than they had originally anticipated. And so um, the good news is they actually were very proactive and had started using Gremlin ahead of launch. And so they used us to find 35 bugs in their system in a single game day before they ever went live. Had they gone live, some of these might have brought them down. And if they had brought them down on the very first day of their launch, that would have been you know, kind of ugly and wouldn't have been a very good day for them. So um, they were very, very proactive and, and had a great, uh, great first day. So that's kind of some customers. We have some other ones. I don't want to make this too much of a sales pitch, but um, I'm going to wrap it up and say thank you. And you can see and look for our founders who are also out there doing presentations and webinars and things like that. And once again, um, they came out of this market to build Gremlin to provide value to you guys. So Brandon, I think that's uh, where I'm ready to pause and um, let you uh, have Billy start doing some presentation. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, awesome. Uh, thank uh, you for uh, presenting uh, all of that. I mean, <laughs> I'm I'm fascinated by uh, the chaos engineering concept and using uh, you know using chaos to really uh, build resilience in in your systems. It it just uh, it kind of seems like a no brainer that we we should have been doing a little bit sooner, but. Uh, you know, I'm glad that uh, you guys at Gremlin are really kind of pioneering a, a, a platform to uh, to deliver this as a solution to everybody. It's uh, uh, definitely got a ton of benefits, as you've explained here. Um, Billy, uh, I want to bring you in here. I think you have some uh, you have some demonstrations of how to use uh, Gremlin. Um, why don't you give us a little bit of uh, give us a little preface on what you got today? Yes, thank you very much, Brandon. And thank you very much, Kelly, for giving this presentation for Chaos Engineering and Gremlin. I think basically it's it's about time for most of the organizations to start to start shifting their mindset from actually trusting the uh, cloud providers that they will handle the load balancing, that they will handle the auto scaling for them and actually start architecting the systems uh, resilient by themselves. 
So um, I think the overview that you gave pretty much uh, summarized what the toolset is about, what the uh, what the theory behind this. And I think uh, now we can make a short demo uh, to demonstrate how it works and also the strong parts of it. And when we say strong parts, it's it's basically all about integrating it with uh, other systems. And for this demo, we'll make sure to connect Gremlin and Datadog and uh, to see uh, how we can hold an attack that's been uh, started from Gremlin and hold it from Datadog automatically. Uh, so at this point, uh, we just have a virtual machine, Ubuntu virtual machine that has installed the Gremlin client and also the Datadog client, uh, which is a very basic setup. And um, that's being done only with uh, trial accounts for uh, Datadog and also for Gremlin. The same can be applied on every uh, on every setup. So as we said, uh, from Datadog, you know that Datadog is a tool for monitoring services, for monitoring machines, and uh, whatever might be powering their infrastructure. And for this specific case, we will create a very basic monitor uh, that will uh, that will follow the CPU utilization of our uh, of our virtual machine, and uh, if the idle state goes uh, above 40%, then uh, it will make sure to actually terminate the attack if it's coming from Gremlin, of course. Uh, so let me uh, start initializing the monitor. It will be a basic metrics monitor, and uh, we are uh, not going to uh, change the first step. It will be just a threshold alert, and as I said, uh, starting with CPU idle metric, uh, then having to choose the uh, what, what the instance is. Uh, by the way, in order to be able to see the instances, we just need to um, we need to connect Datadog with the API of Gremlin using the API key from Gremlin. I will just show that also how we can find this. Uh, we'll make sure to just uh, show a simple alert without any complexities, and we say. Um, we will trigger that when we have the CPU idle uh, below or equal to at least once in the last five minutes to let's say 40%. We know that uh, Datadog um, measures CPU utilization in percent, in percentage. Um, then um, let's say what's happening. Let's put a name for this uh, for this uh, monitor. Um, let's say it's high CPU on. Here's the host. And uh, about the notification, I would like to be, uh, for now, I would like to be notifying all the all, all the people that are actually subscribed for this workspace. I'm going to save this one. So here is the monitor that I have. Uh, at this point, I'm ready to also integrate the webhook that will trigger Gremlin and will say, hey, uh, we want you to stop the attack at this point because it's causing, let's say, harm to our systems, and we don't want that. I'm going to the integrations part of it. Uh, so uh, here's the place where we integrate Gremlin and Datadog. It's already configured. I did that for the for for uh, for the time of this uh, webinar because didn't want to lose time with it. It's basically installing it and adding the API key. No more complexity behind. No more complexity sits behind it. Configuring the webhook uh, actually is also a basic step. You're just adding a new webhook, giving it a name. I have a cheat sheet, uh, so I will copy my values from there. Uh, give me a second. Here's the name, uh, the webhook URL. So I want the request to go to this URL, which is from the API of Gremlin and says hold the attacks that are ongoing at this point. Uh, here is the payload. that I want to be sending from uh, Datadog. It's the word status and the link from it comes from. And we are adding a custom header to make sure that we authorize ourselves. Yep. Here's the custom header. Uh, the header is an API key from Gremlin as well. OK, let's save that. Uh, so currently we have the integration with a webhook. We go back to monitors. And um, I'm going to add this integration to the monitor. So whenever something happens, it can trigger the webhook. Edit the monitor from 
Datadog, and I, uh, apart from the people that I would like to notify, I also want to have a webhook. Yeah, it was my bad. I put that on the wrong place. It should have been here actually. Here is all, and here is also the webhook. Here's the webhook. Sorry, that was my bad. Here we go. Uh, we go to events. So this is the place where we can actually follow up what's going on. Uh, I can see that at this point I modified the monitor. Let's go back to Gremlin. Uh, oh, I didn't expect that. I think, uh, Brandon, you can pick up and uh, continue for, for a second. By, uh, by the time that I'm looking for the email with the credentials that I have, I'm sorry that this happened, but this is kind of strange. Yeah, not a problem. While you're uh, while you're searching for that, Kelly, I think you have a bit of a more simple test, like a black hole test, right? Do you have a quick demo that you could present on that bit? You're back. Can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, so you know, you know, what Billy's trying to do is actually demonstrate how you have to have observability along with tools like Gremlin in order to really do true true CAS engineering, and so. That's why we partner with companies like Resolute because we're not the experts on Datadog or AppDynamics or whatever uh, observability platform you're using. However, I do have a little example here while uh, he's preparing uh, that I can show you that is a video so I don't have to do anything like log into something. Um, and so uh, remember, this is live TV. So what I'm gonna do right now is just run a little attack against a small e-commerce site. And this is called the Hipster Shop. And this is actually a map of the microservices and so this is a this is a site that was actually created uh, by Google for testing and, and validating microservices uh, in Kubernetes. Um, so I, ironically, we've downloaded their shop, and now we're going to run it on EKS, which is an Amazon uh, environment. Um, this is an Istio of the data path within uh, their application. But what we're going to do is what we want to do is map a dependency and see if we kill one of these containers. Um, how do we validate that it's not impacting the application? So some of these, obviously, if we kill the front end, it's gonna impact the application. What we wanna do is we wanna validate and make sure that something like an ad service does not impact the application. So we wanna stop that from running in order to then test and see if the app is still you know, um, gonna run. And so what we're gonna do here, um, hopefully you can see this still. Are we good? Yep, we're good. Okay, so what you're going to see here first, you're going to see we're actually on the site. Um, and this is just the hipster shop with some, you know, it's a fake e-commerce site that Google created. And uh, we're going to black hole the advertisement. Now, there's a reason we're going to do a black hole instead of a shutdown. So I'll show you here. Uh, we want to kill that advertisement um, service that's running. So we're going to go in here and create an attack. We're going to go to Kubernetes. We're going to search through the until we find uh, the ad service. That's the blast radius. Um, now we're going to do a network attack with a black hole. So I'm going to pause here real quick because I want to show you things where we can do things like a black hole attack where we put an IP address or a host name in. This is where you would actually potentially run a test against an external dependency like PayPal that I had mentioned earlier. Um, so when he unleashes the gremlin here, what you're going to see is that we're going to black hole all traffic to and from uh, this particular container. And let me explain why that's important. Kubernetes automatically takes a pod or container, and if it's gone, it will reschedule it. It keeps bringing it back up. That's one of the advantages or features is automatic failover. So you can't use a shutdown attack on a pod because it'll just keep popping up. So how do we, how do we make a pod look like it's gone, but let Kubernetes think it's still there? We black hole. So what we're doing is setting up a sidecar container that actually absorbs the traffic to and from that container. Kubernetes still sees it's running, so he doesn't try to reschedule it. And now the rest of the application doesn't see it and it's gone. So what we're going to do is unleash this attack. And once it's running, we'll go back to the uh, hipster shop here once the, the attack is running. And when we get back to the hipster shop, we can re refresh the screen and we'll see the advertisements disappear. Now, what do we want to do? Well, let's see if we can still buy stuff. Let's put something in the cart. Let's check out. 
hey, it works. So what we've now done is a chaos experiment that has validated that the ad service is not a critical dependency of this application. OK, so we just stopped it. We're going to refresh again and the ad service should magically reappear. And we're now back to a steady state uh, because the application is functioning properly. And there it is. Nice. So that's just a simple, uh, a simple example of a, of a demo environment attack that we can do. Um, obviously, this is just one little thing, but um, I'll go back and let's see if Billy's ready now. Well, um, I'm not sure if I'm ready because I think it's not a problem with the account itself. No idea why it threw me out and it's not allowing me to log in anymore. Um, it says invalid password, then it says that I'm not going to be able to log in in two minutes. I wait, <laughs> it's still the same. Yeah, it's probably service unavailability and uh, I didn't really expect that to happen just right at this point when demoing it. Sure, sure. Well, like uh, like Kelly said, this is live TV, so uh, sometimes things happen, but I think all in all, we've got a little bit of a, a preface on you know what chaos engineering is, what all that entails, and we have a little bit of an understanding of what Gremlin can offer as, as a platform for developing and implementing tests for chaos engineering. And we also have that little bit of a demo with the black hole, I think, you know, kind of shows just one one little bit of the testing that uh, is available in in Gremlin's platform. Maybe in a subsequent webinar, our Chaos Engineering 201, we'll dive a little bit deeper and see a, a couple more of the tests. And Billy, we'll, I'll work with you to, to kind of come up with what those uh, what those will look like. So be on the lookout for a follow up webinar on some chaos engineering we will probably involve uh, another uh, resource at Gremlin, maybe one of their uh, engineers to do to do some of that. But all in all, I think we've hit the end of our content. We do want to open it up for questions if anybody has any of those. So if you haven't taken the opportunity yet, uh, go ahead and open up the question sidebar there and type in your questions. Hey, Brandon, by the way, one thing I would mention is that what Billy was showing is our integration with Datadog. We are rolling out integrations with other observability platforms. Um, and that's not just for two-way interaction, being able to fire off a test or end a test uh, like he was setting up. We also now have the ability to do something called a status check where we can reach out and talk to your environment to check and validate that your environment is running in a nominal state. We do not want to run tests if you're in a degraded situation or if you're already dealing with a problem. And so we can actually uh, set rules that say, if the, if the site is telling us that something is wrong, we will not run the test and we can Essentially, we have integration with a whole bunch of the um, the tools, and then you can also import those yourself. So we're, we're building a lot of that functionality into the system to be able to integrate. And that's what uh, Billy was showing, and, and it's very cool stuff. So hopefully we'll be able to do that again. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for mentioning that. All right, we'll give uh, we'll give everybody a few minutes here to to ask any questions. Um, so far, we don't actually have any. So I, I thought there would be a, a few things here and there that people might have some questions about, but uh, it appears like we're we're doing OK. Yeah, I think uh, I think we'll probably go ahead and wrap things up. So again, uh, Billy and Kelly, I want to thank you guys for being on the webinar today. Really appreciate you guys putting in the time and effort to to put this content together. If anybody, any of the attendees have any questions, uh, you can go ahead and reach out to uh, me directly. Um, you can reach out to me via email. It's uh, brandon.nyes. Brandon.nys at resolutesoftware.com, or you can find us on LinkedIn, Twitter, or Instagram. Go ahead and uh, find us on one of those uh, social platforms. You can also find Gremlin online at gremlin.com. And uh, if you haven't, uh, they also have a Slack channel. It's a chaos engineering Slack channel. Some pretty interesting stuff, and you can find resources and things there as well. So with that, we thank everybody for joining us and spending a part of your day with us. Uh, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Goodbye.